So disclosure here, um, I did a similar discussion last year and I had a ton of fun, but at that time mind and matter was a thing that I did like in my spare time. And in the last 12 months, it's become a thing that I do all the time. So I was really nervous today and my business partner who's here and you'll meet him in a minute promised that if I do a good job, I get to go to Waffle Bar for a treat. So the more enthusiastic your reaction, the more likely I am to get a waffle. Just saying. <laughs> Leaving that there for you guys. Okay, um, so again, my name's Andrea Garcia. I am the Chief Mind Officer at uh, Mind & Matter. We are a meaningful design studio, really formed on the idea of bringing people together, making connections. The way we do that is through some of the techniques and philosophies I'll talk you through today. So, we will go through social media practices. We'll go through what the landscape looks like, how you go through the process of defining your voice, how you stand out above the noise, because if you're on any social channel at all, there's a lot happening all the time. Like, you have to be able to break through that noise. And then finally, how you measure your success. I'll leave some time for questions, depending on how fast I talk. It's generally fast, so you should have like ample question time. So, we'll start with social media practices. There are a lot of reasons that marketers use social media. We use marketing, excuse me, we use social media for brand awareness, to listen to customers, to engage with customers, to do straight up promotion. So what you think of as advertising, to increase your SEO rankings. Like there are tons of reasons to do social. You'll notice that I did split out, listen to, and engage with customers. I believe that those are two distinctly different activities with different purposes. You listen to customers to hear what they're saying about you when you're not in the conversation, when you're not in the room. Your brand is really that, what people say when you're not there, how people think of you. When you engage with customers, you create the opportunity to have a relationship with them to solidify what you think your brand is with them through direct conversation. So I do like to keep those things very distinct and separate, and I'll talk about them as separate activities. Cool. So, do you know why you practice social media? Like, as a business, as an individual, do you know why you do it? And I would guess there are at least a couple of people in this room, and it's not bad, it's not wrong, that say, because I have to. I have to. And you do, like not wrong. But if the only reason that you're on a channel is because you feel like you should be there, you're not going to be able to give that channel your all. You're not going to be able to put out meaningful content that connects with your consumers. You're not going to be able to amply tell your story because you're just doing it because you have to. Like I always did my math homework, so thank you Whitney for reminding me, like marketers aren't mathematicians, like I always did it. But I didn't try really hard. I wasn't like really good at it. But if you gave me a book report, I'd read that book three times before I had to do it. Like you are always going to be more motivated when you're passionate about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So when you know why you do something, you will become more motivated. You'll become more engaged. You'll be able to better fulfill what you're trying to do on that channel. Your why can be anything. It can be to listen to your customers. It can be to engage. It can be to straight up sell things. Whatever that is, like, it is the right answer. As long as you know it, you believe in it, and that's the basis of your strategy. How many of you watched Simon Sinek start with why? Yeah, if you haven't, it's an amazing TED Talk. But basically, the impetus is just that. When you know why you do something, you will do it better. You will more authentically connect people, and the story you tell will be more impactful. Know that in social media, the landscape changes, shifts, evolves, the tools change all the time. How you do what you do may change, but why you do it will always stay the same. So root down into that, and if you need to take some time, take that step back and know what your why is or work through it as an individual, as a brand, as a company, do it. I think it's a worthwhile exercise. So, now that we know why you're on social media, we'll talk about how. There are a lot of channels. And as entrepreneurs, as small business owners, it can be easy to know that there are big brands doing all of the things. Like Alyssa was up here and she talked about Wendy's. 
do any of you have the resources to run social media like Wendy's does? If so, I, okay, cool. So we're running one, two, three, four people operations. Like they can have one person per channel. Like I'm doing it all for myself, for our business, and for some of our clients. Like I don't have time to specialize. I can only be as impactful as the decisions I make. So knowing where I want to spend my time, knowing which channels support my ultimate goals, and where I'm willing to put in the effort is the key to starting my social media strategy or supporting any social media strategy. These are the rough numbers caveat. Um, they're a couple of months old and there have been some things in the social world that have maybe like changed a little bit in the last week or two. I don't know if you've watched C-SPAN at all, um, but just saying. Cool. So there have also been a number of platform changes. Again, social is always evolving. With Facebook, um, the friends and family algorithm is kind of what they're referring to right now and that is decreasing the number of brand posts you see in a timeline increasing the number of friends and family posts. Um, that's good if you sell things uh, direct to consumer through your personal page. Not great if you want to be able to track what you're doing. If you want to run an actual business page. If you want SEO to tie what you're doing on Facebook to what you're doing as a business activity. So it's kind of benefiting those people who are skirting the issues or the like, rules. It's a little bit more challenging to the people doing things the way we want to be doing them through the right channels in measurable like effective um, platforms and then again in the last two weeks there's been an increased kind of scrutiny around ad buys who's getting data how we're sharing data people are getting really grumpy about Facebook I tend to think that there will be some shifts in the legislation in the platforms and people will come back like I don't think it's going to be a long-term detriment to the program on Instagram you can now follow hashtags rather than individual users so I freaking love taking pictures of my cocktails if you go on my Instagram AK Garcia 331 um, you will see a lot of pictures of my dog, a lot of pictures of cocktails, a lot of pictures of coffee. Rather than follow every single bar in the city, I can follow Drink Local KC and like get all the scoops on the good ones. That's good for me, a consumer of information. That's bad for bar liquor brand, a producer of information. So when you're putting out content, be cognizant of the hashtags you use and then what's going to be used pretty frequently and how you can kind of game that algorithm. I actually read a really interesting article here this morning about micro versus mega influencers. Influencer marketing is like super, super hot right now. If I can get person with 40,000 followers to post about my thing or what I do, like everything will like be nirvana and all this information will come flooding to me. What we found is generally people with like lower to mid-range high follower counts like 900 people get far more um, engagement in their sponsored posts than your mega 40,000 like person influencer because that person has likely bought some followers. It's likely people like them who are just putting out a ton of content rather than becoming a trusted source, rather than engaging with their consumer base, rather than like really having a conversation on social. So I thought that was really cool because I've been like grumpy about influencer marketing in like the giant influencer hashtaggy range, but that feels like really right for me. Um, Twitter, if you've been on Twitter later, I like Twitter's my bread and butter for social media. It's my favorite site. Um, it's also the one I resisted getting on the longest. Um, I can't scroll through my timeline and have a straight chronological. I realized a few weeks ago I wasn't following someone that I thought I was following because their tweets showed up so frequently in my timeline from everyone else liking them. So again, beneficial to you. You'll get more eyes on your tweets, but you have to create engaging content. And then in general, um, again, influencer marketing is one of my like hot buttons. Um, if you work with an influencer, please, please, please be sure that they disclose that they are in fact being like compensated in some way for that endorsement. The FTC is getting a little bit like more fussy about it, and it's just a good idea to keep yourself like not being like sued. Our lawyer speaking at four, so if you want to go see Chris Brown, highly recommend. Cool. So, because of these changes in the algorithm, organic reach is declining. 
it is harder to get eyes on what you put out in the world. So you have to create content, you have to craft a content strategy that will help more people see what you put into the world. And you do that by creating really good content. We'll talk about how you do that in a minute. Sometimes, because the algorithm, no matter what, isn't going to get the eyes that you want on that particular piece of content, you have to pay for it. And that's okay. I know that we're working with different budgets than like our big mega brands, but when you spend effectively, when you plan for what you want to spend and how you want to spend it, that spend can be lower and it can be more impactful than just throwing money at a boosted post. And again, we'll talk about that. So, I lost myself. There we go. Goals and expectations. Once you define your why, you can actually set goals according to it. So when you say, I want to do social media because I want to increase brand awareness, cool, you need to measure your reach on your posts. I want to do social media because I want to engage with more customers. Awesome, you need to track likes, clicks, and shares. I want to boost sales. Include promotion codes from your social media so you can see who's buying things from your posts. So what you want to do directly impacts how you do it and how you measure what you're doing. If you're getting all this data, Alyssa alluded to the amount of information you can find on the back end of your Facebook, of your Twitter, of your Instagram, Pinterest, whatever channel you are on has rich demographic information, has post information that you can use to understand how effective you're being. Looking at your post every once in a while, I'd be like, man, that post got 25 likes. Like, that was pretty good. But you might have a post that had way more eyes on it. Like, you can set better expectations on what is actually successful. So, measure, plan strategically, measure with intention. Again, just looking at numbers as a broad overview is cool. It helps you learn a little bit, but when you know what you're actually looking for, what week over week, month over month, year over year growth change and shifts look like, that's where you start to be able to craft a meaningful social media strategy. If you're working with clients, to tell them and give them numbers as to how successful they are, or if you want to instigate a change, what that looks like and why you want to do it, why you believe it will be successful. So everything we do, even though marketing is a little bit of an art, it is very touchy-feely, like we are getting more and more data that we can use to be effective. And if you aren't using the information available to you to be the best version of what you can do, like you're wasting your time. So take the time, dig in. I also, like I tweeted it, I love a good spreadsheet. I love a good pivot table. Like, get in there with the data. And if you don't know what it means, like, just Google the hell out of it. Like, there are a lot of resources on the internet that will tell you. So, developing your voice. This is, like, my bread and butter. I love it. Um, and I kind of introduced myself, but I didn't do, like, the full shebang. So that's me. I'm Andrea. Um, I am an HR person by education, a business analyst, HR person, salesperson, marketing manager, account manager, um, copywriter by trade. I think that like covers a good chunk of time. Uh, blogger, I have foodie, what else? Oh, I'm basic. Yeah, that's right. Um, I talk really fast. I run really slow. I have short legs. I'm sure that's like shocking to everyone. This is Drew. Drew's over there, too. He's sitting below his picture conveniently. Um, Drew's a graphic designer um, by education, by trade. He's worked in production design, a marketing manager. He does all of our photography. He looks way more hipster than I do. Um, he's more of a social media lurker. He'll giggle about things and, like, show me tweets that are funny, but, like, isn't out there as much as I am. Um, a pancake aficionado, Drew runs really fast and talks a lot slower. I think balance in our business is very important, so I wanted to like put that out there. And there we are together, like we're a team-minded matter. We do balance each other quite a bit. Um, we're both yoga teachers, uh, so for me wearing like bottoms that aren't from Lululemon, were re like that was hard for me today, but it felt like the right thing to do. Um, we're community activists. We're very passionate about Kansas City. Um, we are soccer fanatics. That's actually how we met and started working together. Uh, marketers and generally like a flurry of controlled chaos. Not pictured is LP, our chief puppy officer. Um, she has not had a haircut in several months. 
and just not photogenic right now. So we have a lot happening. We have each of our individual business, um, excuse me, social profiles. We have what we do together. And then we also have our client work. So when we look at a social voice, there's a lot to manage. And when we were first starting out, we said, what sets us apart? Like as marketers, we were both essentially working as marketing managers at the time. So we were doing what we do now, but in a corporate kind of team of the space. And let's face it, um, marketing can feel kind of gross. Um, it sucks, but it's true. There's big data. How many times have you like mentioned that you might get a new blender the next time you get on Instagram? You get four promoted posts for daiquiris and blenders. Like, oh, why are you doing this to me, man? Like, it's weird. Um, you look at something on Amazon once and you'll see ads for it for months after, even after you buy it. Like, get off my like case, dude. I already did this. Um, you're on it all the time, especially if you are an entrepreneur, you're a developer, you're a creative. Social media is how you reach people. It's how you sell in this space. It's how you prove you're effective at what you do in this space. So it feels like you're always on, always marketing, and it can get really draining. And finally, everyone has access to the tools. Everyone can be on Facebook. Everyone can be on Instagram. Everyone can be on Twitter. Everyone can be on YouTube. And when you see people out there doing what you want to do and doing it really poorly, it's even more frustrating when you're playing by the rules and you see their interactions, their likes, and it seems to be going up. It can just be extremely draining. So knowing that there are people like us who love to share stories, who are really good at what they do, but are struggling in the communication and the marketing space, like what could we do to help them? What set us apart as an agency from everyone else? And our first thought was, what if we applied what we do to yoga to marketing? And if we did that, it would probably look something like this. Um, yes, that is a real picture that we did take, not specifically for this slide. I, it was in the bank. Like, I knew I would have one time to use it. This is it. But really, um, what we do doesn't look like that. Um, but again, caveat, we are generally dressed like that when we are, like, working. But when I approach a social media strategy, I look at how I plan the yoga class. I have to know who my audience is. I have to know what I'm about, why I'm about to do what I do. I have to know a goal. So in a yoga class, we choose a peak pose for you. It'll be your goal. Like, I want someone to buy something from me. I build my entire class around that goal. I drop little pieces of the message that I'm going to tell throughout every single interaction, everything we do in that hour we spend together. I have to be ready for a curveball. My Tuesday night class is infamous. I plan it. I put so much like loving care into it. If someone walks in, it's like, man, I really just want to do like this one thing. I'm like, oh, I didn't plan that. But I'm a sucker and a softy, so I like scrap my plan. Don't scrap your plan, but like be ready for something to change, something to pivot. Keep everyone safe. Good rule of thumb. Have a kick-ass playlist. Um, in yoga, it matters. I think that it helps like through the day. So that's just my general advice to you. Like always have a kick-ass playlist. But when we talk about actually implementing social media, or excuse me, yoga principles into social media, what does that look like in a day-to-day -day when developing a voice, when developing a strategy? And I think there are four ways to do that. First is to be mindful. So who is talking? Sometimes when I'm on social media, I'm me. Again, AK Garcia, 331. You can find me literally anywhere using that. I talk about otters. I talk about cheese. I talk about Harry Potter. I talk about my dog. I talk about Kansas City, soccer, general nonsense. Ooh, athletes dating. I talk about that a lot. Social media gold. People will interact with those all day long. Are you talking on behalf of your business? So for me, I tend to send out a lot of things from Mind and Matter, but it's not me talking. It's part of what I represent, but I have to know that that voice is different. I have to represent both Drew and myself, the principles and the values we've decided, and to communicate effectively to anyone who might see that, who we are and why they should want to work with us. If you are a marketer, freelancer, writer, whatever that is, and you're on behalf of a client, are you using your voice or are you using theirs? And that's when it comes to sitting down and really understanding what you want to accomplish for social media for you or for them. 
if you are running several accounts and every single one sounds the same, you're not using their voice, you're using yours. Take a step back and figure out, again, what's your why, who are you, what are your values, and how do you convey that with that voice? Who are you talking to is next. Who do you think it is? We had a client who would tell us all day long that their audience was millennial men, like 25 to 32. But when you got into their data, it was women mid-30s to early 40s. So the message they were trying to put out wasn't going to resonate to who was actually seeing it. So at that point, you have a problem in either what you're messaging or who you're reaching. So how do you attract the audience that you want, or how do you pivot your message to the audience you have, to your actual consumers? And that's a decision that you have to make as a business. And finally, does it align with your why? The voice, the content, the strategy, it always has to align with what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. We use the term values-based marketing a lot, and it is a little bit buzzwordy, but at the end of the day, you have to know what your business is about, what you're trying to convey, and consistently reinforce that message in every single interaction, every single touch point. My friends, people that I know strictly online, will tag me in things with otters in it because my personal brand is that strong. Like, you want that to happen. And you get cute otters all day. Like, it's really nice. Like, not the otters, so that's mine. So, like, you find your thing. Um, be authentic. Um, is this truly your voice? There's been a really interesting trend in social media um, where everyone's starting to sound the same. We see these mega brands do something, create a voice that is very different, maybe than other people have seen, and then everyone starts to do it. And it starts to feel a little bit inauthentic. It starts to feel a little fake, a little planned, a little phony. So when you're talking on social, are you being true to you? Does it sound like something that would come out of your actual mouth? My tweets do. My Instagram does. Like I'm pretty like me all the time, as you could likely guess. Is it you as a brand? Again, there's a difference between you and your brand, or maybe there isn't. We have another client who is so entrenched in the brand, it is 1,000% her. And when you have the conversation, when you build pieces of material, you have to think, would she say this? What word would she emphasize? Would she drop an F-bomb? She probably would. Sometimes she does. And be able to plan for that. And finally, as an agency, again, if all of your voices across every single brand sound the same, you're no longer being authentic to that individual piece, person, or idea. Like, you're just putting you with some different profile pictures. Is this inspired or is it fear of missing out? FOMO, um, I use that a lot. Again, you see these mega brands, and I think one of the really hot trends in the past two years has been, been being really snarky on the internet, and that's fine, unless you're doing it just because you saw like a burger chain doing it. Um, dog rates is another like really popular. Uh, Whitney did their, their Good Plans Brent, which perfect. Um, but when you start interacting like the voice of another brand just because they're popular, like you lose your authenticity. That's not you. You want to be able to be unique to stand out because you sound like you. And finally, are you using your measuring stick? It's really easy to get caught up in what everyone else is doing, especially with social media, because you can see how your competitors are doing. You can see their interactions. You can see their likes. You can see their follower counts. And if it feels like they're growing in a really fast way and you're not, it's easy to say, well, I want to do exactly what they're doing. I saw yoga studio down the street post a headstand picture, and I'm going to post a headstand picture. Like at that point, you're always going to be behind the curve. It will always come off as like, oh, they just did what the person down the street did. And it'll always be a little bit less effective than what you could actually put out into the world. You limit yourself when you use someone else's measuring stick. And that's why we always go back to, does this align to our values? And if my value is to beat someone else, like you're always going to lose to them because you're always going to be behind their curve. 
Make it meaningful. So plan and post with purpose. If you are posting once a day because you should post once a day, please do not post once a day. I tell that to my students all the time. If you're going to do something because the person next to you is doing it, please don't do that. Only post, only plan when you have something meaningful, impactful, important to say. And that's where we get into the organic versus paid. Sometimes you will post something and for whatever reason, perhaps you were insanely clever that day. Perhaps you're insanely clever every day, but the right person saw it today and it goes viral. Cool, a lot more people are going to see that. Perhaps you plan a post that you know you want a lot of people to see and you choose to put some money behind it. Now that's great. As long as you have a reason you want people to see it, if you're going to pay for people to have eyes on your post, on what you put out into the world, ask them to do something. Ask them to buy something. Ask them to join your mailing list. Ask for an activity that further entrenches them with you because then you can measure your return on investment. If you have a post that a lot of people are liking and you boost it just so more people see it, what have you gained from that? Like, likes are nice, it's good to have eyes, but, but, if you're going to purposefully ask to spend money for a post, or if you're going to go to a client and say, I want to boost this post, here's why I want to do it, and here's how I will measure that it is successful, like, that's impactful, that's adding value, and that's proving your worth and your value. Again, does it align with your goals? Eyes on posts are really cool. And if brand awareness is your goal, by all means, boost a post that you really like. I just happen to think it's more impactful to ask someone to do something while they're there. There's a lot of noise on social media. It feels like it moves so quickly. So, don't add to the noise. Only speak when you have something impactful to say. Make what you say matter. Ask people to come back. Finally, be measurable. And this is one of the biggest things with social media. It's super easy to get caught up in the grind of like it just going and I know that I have to do it and I'm putting posts out there and interacting. But if you're just in go mode all the time, you have no idea how effective you're being. And again, listening to Whitney before us, like revisiting project plans and seeing what was effective, like revisit your social media, see what's effective. But first, determine how much you'll invest. Social media is free. Anyone can sign up for an account. But as a business, as a person, as an agency, you're investing a resource, either your time or one of your resources' time. Effort, if you are buying licenses for Photoshop, if you're buying licenses for photography, if you're paying someone to do photography, videography, like, that's money. And if you decide to boost a post, if you decide to have any sort of cash behind what you do, like you're investing in social media, know what you are willing to put on the table and then be willing to stand by it. And until you know what that budget looks like, how are you going to be able to show that you've returned on that investment? So um, just a really quick, I know all this will be up. But in terms of what you can do organically to maximize eyes on your post versus paid, because there are options across all channels, um, for Facebook, the more likes, comments, shares you have, the more it will pop up in everyone else's um, timelines. I worked for a while for a grocery distributor, and for whatever reason, some of the most popular posts were answers to like, hey, answer this question, and you might get a $15 gift card. Like, I spend more than $15 on groceries, which I think most people probably do. Um, people go nuts. Like, if you can do a low stakes, things like that, which there are some rules around it, like, don't break the rules. But looking at what incentivizes people to interact with you, to like, get that up, it doesn't cost you anything, do it. Um, in terms of paid Facebook, please keep your text light. Facebook downgrades everything within Ads Manager with a ton of text on it. So the less text you have on your actual image, the more eyes will be on your post. For Twitter, create opportunities for conversations, but don't be creepy. A lot of times I'll complain about my allergies because I have like the worst allergies. And allergy medicine people will pop in there and be like, well, if you try a blah, 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 you'll feel better in no time. Dude, if I wanted to at you, I'd at you. Get out. So, be meaningful. Don't be creepy. 
Um, Instagram, use really powerful visuals. Like there are brands that um, have photographers. Like they have these beautifully styled shots and they spend a lot for them. Like know that you can start to game that on your own. Like if you want to hire a photographer, hire a photographer. I happen to know like a really cool agency. But like if you want to be able to do it on your own, like spend the time, be willing to invest your effort to be able to create the powerful visuals and start to develop a style that reflects who you are as a brand or as an individual. Uh, LinkedIn has strong shareable content. I think LinkedIn is great in B2B communications. If you're creating really powerful information that people want to share, more eyes will be on your posts and all of a sudden you're regarded as an industry expert because you're putting out that good information. And finally, uh, Snapchat, uh, organic. I mean, probably not the best part for a brand. I know that, I'll go back to that. We'll put it that way. And then finally, YouTube. Just start to build your base, put out good content, find the appropriate people to follow, and like be really descriptive in your um, brand descriptions, video descriptions. In terms of paid, uh, I got off my rhythm. Sorry, team. We're back on track. I was going every other. We're going to go straight down this list now. So for Twitter, cater to your true customers. I am always super salty when I get promoted tweets in Spanish. I know why I get promoted tweets in Spanish. Like, I'm very, like, aware. I've never tweeted in Spanish. I never interact with any tweets in Spanish. Like, you're wasting your money on me, man. Although, like, the Keebler, like, elf cookie does look delicious. You're not wrong. Um, for Instagram, look at what connects. If you're going to boost a post, like look at the types of visuals that your customer base are interacting with. Like that's your best bet on getting a return on that investment. For LinkedIn, um, again, because that is B2B, you are actually able to better choose your delivery methods. So you can do sponsored in mail and land directly in someone's inbox. I generally shy away from things like that, but you can do some sponsored ads that can be really powerful as well. So that comes down to, again, why are you doing what you're doing? What are you trying to accomplish? Pick the right format. If it is direct person to person, like look at the in mail option um, as more of a billboard, like not the best. So for Snap, you can spend a lot of money and do some really rad stuff with Snapchat, like the sponsored geo filters where I look like Snooky, or I have the unicorn, like Lucky Charms. But General Mills and MTV have a lot of money. Um, again, I don't know about you. Like I'm not rolling in that kind of cash, nor are my clients throwing out that kind of cash. Um, I think Snapchat does create some really nice opportunities to do it yourself for location-based filters that you can use for events like this. So I know WordCamp does have a snap filter for today. Like, use that, it's super fun. You can see who around who's using it, um, especially if you're doing events. So we had a client who did a big First Friday event every month, and we would do a snap filter for that. Their snap filters would get like five downloads every other Friday of the month, and First Friday would be closer to 500. Like, that's a good use of $5 have over 3,200 people and with an eye on their brain. Standing in front of the thing, per use. So when you are crafting your strategy, I think a good rule of thumb, and I will not lie, like I stole this from a friend of mine who I think it's like a really solid opportunity, um, a 70-20-10 rule. So 70% of the content you have share should be directly relatable to your audience. 20% should be curated content from another user. And that is where you can find your strongest brand advocates. When people are tagging you, when they're sharing with you, um, happy customers, or even creating opportunities for that. Like people love to connect. And especially if you have a physical brand of some sort, when people can see what you do and they want to share it with their friends, they can share it from your feed too. Like they love that. Um, we design shirts every once in a while. Um, like this one that I'm wearing today. We design that. Um, and when you have the opportunity to see people wearing it, share it. Um, Drew's designed shirts for American Outlaws, which is a soccer supporters group. So every once in a while, people will post things, or you'll see randomly people out in the world like wearing shirts that Drew designed. And it's really awesome to be like, hey, we designed that. Do you mind if we snap a picture of it? Most people are really into being like models. 
they will say it, they are. Um, so you can share and like personalize and humanize the brand. 10% should be promotional. You have stuff to sell, like sell it. Um, you can't ask, I mean, you can, sorry, you can't get what you don't ask for. And if you aren't reminding people constantly, hey, I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good at development. I'm really good at whatever it is you do. You don't tell people that they can give you money to do that for them. They're never going to give you money to do that for them. And you probably want the money to do that for them. So remind people like every once in a while, oh, by the way, you can hire me. You can buy from me. I can sell to you. I can make you better at what you do, or I can better support you in an area where you might not be as strong. So now what? We've talked about why you want to be on social media. We've talked about how you establish your realistic goals based on your why. You know how to craft a message that aligns with those goals. You test your message. You know that there's rich data behind every single channel out there on the internet. You have access to it as an administrator. If you're not an administrator and you want to be, like, ask to be. And you can gauge your performance. And it's not just, I think things are going pretty well. Set aside dedicated time to dive into the numbers on what you're doing. Make it for every channel. Track how you're measuring against your goals. And if things aren't working the way you want them to, you have time to pivot. You have time to change. Again, your why never changes. That is solid. Your how can. If what you're doing isn't working the way you want it to, change it. If you see one type of post is doing better than any other, post more stuff like that. That's the beauty of social. You haven't bought a billboard. Like, you bought a conversation. That's what you have the opportunity to create. And it can be dynamic. And if it isn't working the way you want it to work, you have the opportunity to fix it. So, at the end of every yoga class, I give two pieces of homework. Um, the first is to drink a lot of water. It's good for you, which is generally true. So you guys can do that as well. Um, the other is to be kind to other people. I also think that that's a good idea. Um, just a general practice. So do that too. But for the purposes of what we're doing today, you have some homework. Know your why. And if you think you know your why, like revisit it. If you know you don't know your why, then definitely figure it out. Understand your how. Channels change constantly. If you decided to be on two social media channels, learn everything you can about them. And don't just do it once. Know that they will change. They will grow. They will shift. Set aside time to learn them, to learn to do them better, and to understand how they help you reach your goals. Determine your voice. Make sure it's yours. Yours as an individual, yours as a brand, or yours as an agency on behalf of your clients. Be unique, but really be solid in it. If it helps to develop an actual physical voice guide where you write that down, write it down. And then you can go back and check, like, does this fit within this voice guide? Does this fit within our brand? It's a worthwhile thing to be able to go back and measure. Make sure your voice is mindful. Make sure it's authentic. Ensure that the content you share is meaningful and that the plan you craft is meaningful. Be sure it's measurable. And not only that it's measurable, but that you choose to measure it frequently, consistently. And then share the heck out of that. Like if you're working for someone and you come across a post that did amazing, tell them. If you had a not-so-great month and you think that you're needing better content, tell your content creators. Like, hey guys, I know that you're brilliant. Okay, let me see what you got. Invest wisely. Your time, your resources, your money. Be sure that you spend wisely. We all have a shortage of all three of those things. And a lot of times social media gets the short end of the stick. So know that it is an important part of your marketing strategy. Be willing to spend time with it and on it. Be willing to put like a lot of intention behind it. And if that isn't what you're willing to do, like, be someone else to do it. 
either hire a resource, hire an agency, hire a consultant, hire someone so that you can focus on what you can do best. And then again, measure often. Um, it's just no, it's not a, hang on, words. It does you no favors to not know exactly what you're doing. And again, it can be a lot of touchy-feely, but getting down into the numbers available to you and actually knowing what is happening to gauge your success and then improve upon it. And then again, be willing to pivot. Know that if things aren't working out just because you want them to, doesn't mean they are. Um, we've had clients who will tell us what they think their brand up is. And that's cool. But if it's not what your brand is, then you need to revisit that. And again, that goes back to what people are saying about you, how people are interacting with you, and who you're talking to. So, um, that's me. That's true. That's who we are. And I have lots and lots of time for questions because I talk fast. Oh, I don't have that much time for questions. I didn't talk as fast as I thought I did. Cool. Still have time for questions. Normally I go way faster than that. You guys don't have any questions? Okay, cool. Oh, Simon Sinek, start with why. Um, is it, yeah, <laughs> told you I'm a talk fast, fast talker. Simon Sinek, it's S-I-N-E-K. And it's start with why, or the power of why, one of the two. Um, he also has a book um, by the same name. And um, that's the other thing. So I get marketing inspiration from a lot of places. I get strategy inspiration from a lot of places. Um, if TED Talks inspire you, like go down that rabbit hole. If you are unfamiliar with a thing called Creative Mornings, um, it's about to come back to KC um, at the end of this month, I believe. It's like a TED Talk. There are 164 cities around the world who do them. Every month they select one word to focus on and a speaker of some sort does their interpretation of that word. Um, I've seen Selena Teo talk about risk. I watched Ryan Maney talk about moments that defined him. John January from Sullivan Picked and Sync on the Power of Language. And you can go into those archives and see all of those. If you are feeling in a creative rut at any time, go to the Creative Mornings website and go watch someone. You will walk away inspired, I promise. Anyone else? Okay, cool. Well, um, I think there's still some cookies over there. Um, you guys get like a little bit of a bathroom break, and I think Rebecca is up next talking about AdWords, which I'm super pumped about. So cool. And again, my name's Andrea. I forgot to do that part. Um, no, I didn't forget to do that, but my name's Andrea. I'll be here or there afterwards if you have any questions that you didn't want to yell at me across the room. Totally get it. Have a great rest of your day.